Welcome to everybody to the series of lectures, A Closer Look at Ukraine, War and Testimonies of Life that has been organized by the uh, Vice Rectorate for Social Responsibility, Inclusive Policies and Equality at the University of Chaume Primet with the uh, support of the, our Office of uh, Social Development and uh, Solidarity. Um, on behalf of the Rector de Balcon, um, I would like to thank you for uh, participating in this series of lectures and above all to our two speakers of this second day of the series lecture. Let me introduce uh, right now uh, to Alexander uh, Palotoy. Uh, he is candidate for the higher doctor degree, PhD. Is an associate professor of general economic theory and economic policy department of Odessa National Economic University. Uh, and also to uh, welcome to Tamara Tawiska. Uh, she is a PhD professor of Taras S. Kenchok. This award was not uh, <laughs> tried for me before, and it's quite difficult, but I, I will to try again. It's uh, Professor of the Taras Estchenko, no. National University of Kiev. I want to say that we appreciate so much this um, uh, collaboration in this series that we have started in this uh, series of lectures that have been supported by three um, uh, researchers that are from Ukraine that are uh, right now uh, joining uh, research groups in our university, in Universita Chauma Primera. I want to thank uh, to Victoria, Natalia, and Elsa, Olesa to help us to uh, organize this uh, series lecture. I think that a very important um, tie is uh, willing right now with this series lecture between us and our universities. And uh, we hope that uh, this lecture can be a uh, way to be wider this tie that we have uh, and deep this uh, tie that we have uh, building. Well, uh, without any other word to add to this uh, introduction to the general uh, series lecture, I want to um, uh, share with you the, the title of the talk that uh, Professor Alexander uh, Palotoy uh, will to, uh, um, show us this, this evening. Uh, the title uh, of the talk is about the economy of Ukraine, major challenges, impacts of the war, and development prospects. Uh, thank you for staying with us for uh, say yes to this uh, invitation, Alexander, and the floor is yours. Can you see my presentation? Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, buenos dias. It's a great honor for me to be invited uh, to deliver this lecture or this presentation. And I really thank you very much for your sympathy, for your interest uh, about the Ukrainian problem, because I understand that it's going on quite far from you, however, so you are not indifferent. It's very important for us and, and any support now we are I'm, I'm in Ukraine. It's very, very important for us and crucially important. So I, um, the topic of my lecture has been already, or my presentation has been already announced. Uh, I wanted, as Halesian set me a task, uh, to introduce uh, you into the economy of Ukraine in general, and I wanted to cover not only um, uh, such superficial things like the immediate impact of, of the war on human lives, but to talk also about 
in general about the economic model of Ukraine, uh, about, um, about the challenges uh, we are facing, because really um, it will be maybe, to some extent, it will be a bitter truth, because we really, we Ukrainians really, to my mind, advanced in building democratic institutions. We really advanced in forging our national identity, uh, but uh, with um, um, economic issues, to my mind, there are some troubles, but I believe in better future. And I, I believe that they all uh, uh, will be fixed in future because we should be optimists. So uh, I'm, I'm representative of Odessa National Economic University. It's university with 102 years history and before for the Bolshevik revolution there in this building there was a commercial school so uh, our history of teaching economic disciplines is even more ancient than uh, um, than more than 100 years it goes from the 19th century so. then, and uh, I after our victory I and Alessia as well, I think um, we'll uh, invite, uh, we'll be happy if you come to Odessa and see um, our beautiful city, our famous opera theater. So Odessa represents different styles of very beautiful uh, European architecture. Uh, and uh, um, you see this, the Tonkin Stairs from the famous film. And um, uh, luckily, uh, Odessa remains almost intact. So I'll start to talk a bit about the everyday life, and then, as I, as then I'm going to shift to more specific economic uh, issues. Uh, um, luckily, the historical center, uh, you see, the backs we sent around Duke de Richelieu as a governor of Odessa. However, it's, it remains intact also. The, some historical buildings uh, experienced some minor damages as a result of the Russian terrorist attacks on the Odessa port and different other objects in the historical center of the city. Uh, however, so I, uh, I have never uh, left Odessa from 24th February of 2022. Also, we were aware that Odessa is crucially important for Russia, first of all, to cut Ukraine from the sea, uh, to turn Ukraine into a ramp state, uh, to, and it's that's a very important so symbolic meaning for Russia. It's like an iconic city because Odessa is famous, iconic city, because Odessa is famous for its culture, for its humor, um, for its Hilarities. Um, and uh, that is why, but um, due to our courageous armed forces, yes, we, the occupiers didn't manage to come by land to approach Odessa very close by land. And now, luckily, in November, they were pulled out to the left bank of Dnieper. But I hope that very soon, under <clears throat> the counteroffensive, the left bank of Dnieper River will be liberated as well. However, some suburbs, for example, the resort of the Toka, you can see it suffered very much from Russian shellings. Probably there have been some military um, objects, I don't know. And this, it, it is the better, the best, the best resort of Ukraine after the occupation of Crimea. And now you see that only devastated, devastated town and only the crowds, the crowds of hungry dogs. And just before the war, there were very, very luxurious um, different hotels, uh, townhouses, and so on. So it's like a suburb of Odessa. So uh, despite our city center is almost intact, just in front of us there, uh, a lot of devastations, and there is a uh, number, unfortunately, a large number, not a large, but a significant number of victims, uh, including children. However, so let's uh, return um, from the everyday life, let's return to the economic 
questions and I want to announce the outline of my presentation. First of all, I'll, I'm going to talk about the economic model of Ukraine in general, its problems, its challenges, its vices, we, we, can, we can even say. And then I'll talk a bit about the impact of the war of 2014, 2015, because it maybe it was not covered so much in the world and in European media, but the fact uh, Russia launched this war against us in February 2014. And this first phase of war had also very, very devastating uh, impact on Ukraine both on Ukraine economy, on, on the everyday life of people. There have been uh, dozens of thousands of victims in 2014 and 2015. And it also, um, but I'm now focused on economic issues, so that is why it, it had a, a great negative impact on the further uh, economic development of Ukraine. And I'll, then I'll talk about the impact of this full-scale invasion of 2021. And uh, in the summary, uh, I hope uh, we're going to talk about some optimistic prospects, yes, for the economy of Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, oh, here you see, it's a photo taken in Odessa, you know this hero. Yes, this restaurant is called Taverna or Taberna. And uh, this Don Quixote, he got his Ukrainian flag on his spear, yes, after the war has started. So it's also a symbol of our <clears throat> courage and our resistance and our resilience as well. And you see that really Ukraine is the biggest, by its territory, is the biggest country in Europe. Um, I'm not counting for Russia now. Uh, so it has the territory more than uh, 600,000 square kilometers. And you see the length of this front. The length of this front is, uh, it's a picture from June 2022. Now it's a bit shorter, uh, but we also take into account that near Odessa there is an, an unrecognized Transnistria, which in fact is uh, also a territory occupied by Russia for 30, already for 30 years, and there is a military, Russian military troops here, and that is why so the, the, the front line may be even longer, like a, a car ride, for, 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 for example, from Warsaw to Madrid, yes, and our soldiers need to keep this front line, and only, I think only this illustration can show uh, uh, the extent of this impact of war on Ukraine in general and on the economy of Ukraine. But the pictures, like uh, I start with the pictures from social media, and here you see the occupied territories. Uh, it's also from the previous year's pictures. Luckily, luckily uh, a part of the territories have, have been liberated in September and in November. However, you see that these territories are occupied by Russia, were bigger than Hungary, were like 41% of Italy, so just to understand the scale of this invasion. Uh, now uh, they are smaller and we are hoping that it will be improving in future. So, and here you see some also data taken from uh, social media about the importance of Ukraine. Uh, because uh, Ukraine um, is one of the richest countries uh, in the world, maybe in top 10 richest country in terms of uh, deposits of different resources, including different ores, um, uranium ores, ores of other um, um, rare metals. And uh, it's important agricultural hub so to say, and one of the biggest producers all over the world of agricultural production, which uh, fits a lot of countries all over the world, especially when <laughs> we're talking about African countries. And uh, Ukraine is uh, to a large extent integrated into the global commodities cha uh, chains, not 
not only in terms of, of food production, but also uh, in terms of supplying of these different metals, which are needed for uh, the production of microelectronics. Um, some um, components, for example, for railway building, um, and so on. Um, uh, here you see, I wanted to put it more, uh, so more understandable. I decided to make some comparisons between Ukraine, between Poland as our country, as, as our closest neighbor, which is uh, which had pretty, pretty the same type of economy in the beginning of market uh, transformations, which uh, now probably it has more populations in Ukraine in the beginning uh, of these transformations. Uh, Ukraine had 52 millions of population, Poland probably about 38. But Poland is the result of the successful reforms. Unfortunately, we failed to realize such kinds of reforms, but I think it's not too late uh, to do this now. And uh, you see that, and uh, the third one for the comparison, I included just, just arbitrarily, I included Spain. Um, and uh, you, you see here that Ukraine experienced very deep uh, economic crisis, transformational crisis in the beginning of 1990s, while Poland has already started to overcoming it. Uh, it was due to um, due to this um, so disruption of economic ties with uh, another uh, socialist republics, especially with uh, Russian Federation, and uh, because Soviet economy was simply inefficient because it was protected from any competition from abroad, and when this competition emerged. Uh, it was found out that, that a lot of uh, branches of industry, including uh, medium and high-tech production, are not so competitive. Uh, and uh, Ukraine managed to overcome the transformational crisis only in 2000 year, only in the eve of new millennium. And uh, it, show, it has shown um, um, rather successful rates of economic growth in the early 2000s. And some people uh, thought that Ukraine will be a new European tiger, yes, like the new Asian tigers, like South Korea, like Taiwan, uh, Chinese Republic, and so on. However, uh, these dreams uh, did not come true. And uh, especially it became obvious over the global recession or global economic crisis of 2008-2009 and Ukraine was uh, one of the countries who uh, suffered the most from the outcomes of this crisis. And we have a, a drop of national economy by more than 15 percent. It's one of the anti records all over the world. Uh, and then, uh, unfortunately, the uh, economy didn't manage to recover. So it was under stagnation, you see, in 2012, 2013, it was zero growth uh, under the rule of the Yanukovych, who, uh, as you know, who were for our throne and who fled led to Russia um, after the revolution of dignity. And after that, of course, a very, very, very was very heavy impact of the first Russian aggression against Ukraine in 2014 and 2015. Then COVID, and now we have, in the, according to the estimations, we have uh, so a shrink of the Ukraine economy by 30% in 2022. Uh, so we can say that it's the deepest crisis in modern Ukraine history, even deeper than it was in 1994. But uh, if I can say so, it is one of the mildest scenarios among all the possible, because at the beginning of this full-scale invasion, a lot of economists predicted the, uh, so that the economy, the GDP will Fall, yes, the, the fall by 50%. Um, 
And of course, they are not taken into account uh, occupied ter territories. Uh, as for now, 18% of Ukrainian territory are still occupied and they do not, uh, and uh, they are the most industrialized regions, in fact, and they do not take part in, terms of pro in the production of GDP. So that is why, of course, it, it is awful, but it's not the worst scenario among all uh, the possible. And now for uh, the recent projections say that in 2000, uh, in this year, uh, there will be even a small growth, about a 2%. So it's, once more again, it's not bad, but it's to a large extent due to our European and American partners who support us very much with loans and especially with grants. Uh, now you see the GDP for capital. So unfortunately, Ukraine didn't manage to, if it takes GDP per capita in uh, in unchanged prices and by purchasing power parity, you see that Ukraine uh, did not uh, did not manage to attain the level of GDP at the beginning of market before uh, the market transformation in 1990. However, it's and now uh, international institutions like World Bank, like International Monetary Fund, they attribute Ukraine to the lower middle income countries. Previously, it was uh, a higher middle income country. Uh, however, these indicators are a bit tricky. Yes, we are a poor country, but maybe not that poor as you can judge from these indicators. And don't take it from me. I listened, for example, to a Russian economist, Konstantin Sonin. He's in opposition. He's, he worked in America and he's in opposition to Putin. And however, he is a very, very famous economist. And he said that really, he, he, uh, when he have seen the level of life in Ukrainian villages and how these Russian looters, yes, how they stole microwave ovens, different other home appliances, which uh, they have never seen even. So that is why it's uh, possible, he said, that this, and uh, if we, if I include here Russian GDP, it will be more than two times higher than Ukrainian. And so that is why we should take into account also other factors, because I have seen, for example, a report from Russian countryside with wooden houses, with uh, mountains of garbage. I have never seen anything like that in Ukraine. And it depends on many factors and depends among others on mentality, because Ukrainians are the, um, in fact very industrious and they always even poor people try to improve their living condition uh, conditions uh, as much as they can. But there are also different factors. Uh, the level of inequality may be different. Um, Ukraine have a very big um, part, a very big um, uh, extent of shadow economy, almost uh, one third of Ukrainian GDP is in the shadow. And this also, of course, um, makes this indicator not so credible. And moreover, we do not know, it's a bit ironic, but we do not know the amount of population in Ukraine, uh, because um, uh, according to the estimation, it was more than 42 million before the invasion, including, uh, not including for some reason Crimea, but including the occupied territories of Donetsk and Lugansk regions. However, uh, the last census we had in 2001, for some reason, once more again, and uh, uh, two years before the war, it was carried out an estimation of population and, 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 uh, on the territory which, is con which had been controlled by Ukraine at that moment. And it was about 38 million of people. And here in these calculations, there included 42, and that is why it also makes this indicator less credible. However, uh, even if we amend it, it won't be great, and it won't be much higher uh, than it was before the market transformation. That is why we're going, I want to talk about the, some reasons for such situation, um, rather gloomy situation as for me. Here you see a GDP per capita, and you see that it was a sharp decline till the end of 19th, then it was a stagnation, and then it was very, very dynamic growth until uh, 2008. And in 2009, uh, there was a crisis, after which, in fact, the economy is 
and under the permanent stagnation or very, very minor growth. Um, and uh, each such a crisis, so first uh, crisis was transformation crisis, which ended uh, in the end of 1990, and then it was global economic recession, and then it was a crisis uh, associated with the outcomes of Yanukovych and Tazarov's economic policy in 2012, 2013, and associated, of course, with the first Russian invasion. And here you see the devaluation of national currency from five Krivna per one dollar to eight hryvnias, and then from eight hryvnias to 26 hryvnias. And now uh, you see that the devaluation is, is not that great than it was, for example, in 2015. Um, once more again, due to very strict policy of a uh, national bank and due to the very, very, large assistance from international financial institutions and from our European partners and the United States of America. And um, here you see the rate of inflation, the, the rate of inflation. I, I won't now discuss uh, the reasons of difference between GDP deflator and consumer price index. Let's take consumer price index as a, a measurement of living level. And you see that in, the, in 2020, uh, second, it was 20%. So the inflation was, in fact, much lower than, for example, in 2015 under the first Russian um, attack on Ukraine. And uh, there are mul multiple reasons of this uh, economic assistance, first of all, and then um, uh, our government decided to freeze uh, so prices on communal utilities, on communal payments for population, so like for heating, for electricity and so on. So they say that it's time to uh, raise, reconsider them and uh, increase. However, they remain at the pre-war level. It's also one of the, of the important components. And maybe also from the demand side, it can be the large outflow of population. Yes. According, uh, according to different estimations, more than 10 million left of refugees left to Ukraine, and that is why the uh, demand, the aggregate demand, um, has decreased, of course, due to this. However, um, the level of inflation is not critical, not not so much higher than even now in the most problem <clears throat> European countries, like for example, Baltic countries. Uh, uh, here you see the uh, illustration of the uh, Ukrainian model of economic growth, and we can say that it was an export-oriented model, and from the very beginning of market transformation, uh, um, Ukraine economy has largely opened to evolved markets, uh, much more than, for example, Spain and, uh, for example, Poland. But uh, uh, after the crisis of 2008-2009, we also see a stagnation of the share of export in GDP. So now it's about, so in, in the pre-war year, it was about 40%, yes, while in the better year, export amounted, uh, accounted to 60% of GDP. Uh, and that is why it has an impact on the external balance or difference between uh, export and imports. Import, the value of import is much higher than the value of export due to very, very bad terms of trade. I will touch this question later on uh, because the, pro 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 the production, uh, the categories of production as exported by, by Ukraine become more and more uh, cheaper um, because it's not high tech. Mm products, unfortunately, associated as with raw materials, with resource exports. Uh, and that is why uh, we have such a situation of the chronic de uh, deficit of external balance of goods and services. But also, we, mm, you know, one of the factors of the decrease of export was also re reorientation of our trade policy from Russia to the European Union. And Taiwan says that our uh, in 2022, our major partner is European Union, and even uh, the export of Ukraine to European Union increased not only 
at a relative scale, but even its absolute value in US dollars or in Euro has also increased. So and it's, as for me, it's very good. Uh, uh, current account balance, it's a bit better, surprisingly, than the balance of goods and services, but it's, uh, it's not so negative, but it's first and foremost due to the remittance, uh, because Ukraine in 2014 uh, signed a political part of the association be uh, between Ukraine and European Union, and later on there was launched an economic part, and uh, so, uh, three years later, it was also <clears throat> Ukrainians were, were granted a visa-free travel to Europe and uh, as well the possibilities to uh, work uh, for, for the temporary work in the countries of European Union. And uh, according to different estimations, before the war, uh, more than one and a half hundred millions of Ukrainians worked in Poland. Uh, and some of them, by the way, returned to Ukraine and now are defending our country. Uh, however, it's not, of course, it's not an optimal economic model, although it helps us to reduce unemployment, yes, and to uh, cover a bit uh, this negative uh, account balance, yes, and, and that is why it decreased um, our foreign debt, and our government debt as well, uh, public debt. Okay. And here it's a connected question, yes, it's unemployment. The unemployment rate is, uh, in Ukraine is stably high, about 10%. But if you take into account all the workers, all the Ukrainians who work abroad, uh, it will be probably, even in the pre-war year, it will be uh, probably around 25% of total European labor force. If we multiply it by the Olkin coefficient, okay, we can count the losses of our potential GDP, yes. And on the contrary, Poland, for example, uh, um, it helps us very much. And uh, I have been in Poland for two long scholarships for three semesters, Polish very well. So and it's it's really a great country, and but it's also had some advantages from this because we, it absorbs our, our labor power, and uh, Polish economy in fact is working above the production possibilities frontier. So they, their GDP probably maybe even higher than potential due to this attraction of, of the labor power of Ukraine. However, there are not no working places in Ukraine for them, so it's. It's a kind of temporary solution, but in long run, it brings a great damage for, um, damage for Ukrainian uh, economy. And here you see the um, uh, stagnation of high technology exports in Ukraine compared, uh, for example, to other countries like Poland and Spain. Um, here you see a comparison uh, between the uh, structure of uh, commodity export of Poland and uh, Ukraine. So in fact, in the recent publication, it was pointed out that um, it's the countries which specialize in exports of intermediate goods and raw material are very vulnerable to external economic shocks. Because when, when, he, when we have a global crisis, like a crisis of 2008, 2009, like a COVID crisis, yes, we have a sharp fall in the demand for resources. And that is why such countries suffer very, very much. And the countries who, uh, which specialize in production of final goods like consumer goods and capital goods, they are more stable. And here we see that uh, Ukraine, <clears throat> its export-oriented policy uh, so was driven not to strengthening this structure of export due to the increase of uh, uh, export of consumer and capital goods, but on the contrary, shifting to not even to intermediate goods. Intermediate goods, as a rule, they were metallurgy and chemicals uh, in Ukraine, but shifting to raw materials, especially in agriculture. It's more than one third of commodity export, and it's very, very bad. Uh, and for Poland, of course, it's exporting for final goods. Of course, they are. To a, great, to, to a great extent, they are not produced in Poland, but, but, but simply assembled, like Samsung, like Volkswagen, and so on. However, this model is much better than the Ukrainian one. 
Uh, so here is a resource rent. So I, the so the rent from natural resources in Ukraine for the global economic crisis was really huge. And here I want to show you an illustrations from the publication of the uh, Ukrainian economist um, Sergei Karablin. He shows uh, so the inverse re re relation between exchange rate of Ukrainian creepness and inflation. What it's important to say if we talk about inflation that uh, more often uh, more often than not in developed countries the crisis is associated with de deflation, like from the classical uh, textbook from political economy. And in Ukraine, uh, very often uh, economic crisis is associated with inflation. Why? Because uh, the demand for our export drops. Uh, this export of intermediate goods and raw uh, not intermediate that is intermediate goods and raw materials it causes the lack of foreign uh, the lack of inflow of foreign currency into ukraine it influences of course uh, the exchange rate of hryvnia and this exchange rate as you see here there is a direct direct correlation yes because uh, ukrainian consumer consumers consume a lot of imported goods uh, and that is why it has a direct impact on inflation. And that is really, so to say, a disease of Ukrainian economy, this inf inflational kind of crisis. And when, when there is um, an economic crisis, uh, people always expect this inflation from their previous experience. And here you see the correlation between raw, raw materials prices and uh, exchange rate of hryvnia. Once more again, when the prices for raw materials drop, uh, the exchange rate, uh, rate drops as well. Uh, so, and it's, uh, and the GDP drops as well with the drop of the um, raw materials prices on the world market. So it's a kind of vicious circle uh, for Ukraine. And we really in future, when we will rebuild and innovate Ukraine, we should overcome this vicious model of economic, so to say, development. Uh, however, there are some positive signs in the Ukrainian economy. For example, uh, uh, export in uh, information communication services. Also, uh, government doesn't support IT industry very much. However, they are developing on their own and they are really great success. Not in ICT production, yes. Um, uh, the production of ICT, um, components or products is minor, but the production of ICT services is really, really growing. And now our, um, and some of these services have a good applications. Uh, for example, we have such an application called DIA. So it's here you have, here you have all your documents in your smartphone, uh, including passport, including foreign passport. Uh, including your driving license, and you can order some government services here. Uh, uh, it's very innovative program, and now it was announced that it has been introduced in Estonia. Uh, our IT experience was used by Estonia, and now ten. Such e governments um, all over the world. Uh, so, and it's good, it's good, Alexander. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, so okay. Uh, about the global in, uh, innovative potential of Ukraine, it's still very, very big because we have more than 80% of population with tertiary education. Yes, a very, very educated nation uh, comparable to the level of the developed countries. We have still a remains of very, very developed research infrastructure. And our um, scientists, our um, IT specialists, and our engineers are doing our best to um, propose a good innovation output. And here you see that in terms of input, 
Ukraine is only 75th, and in terms of innovation output is in top 50, not far, for example, from Poland and even from Spain. And that is why our human, I hope very much that our human capital and our intellectual potential will be used in future and it will be mutually beneficiary both for Ukraine and for European Union as well. Uh, so here it's a brief summary I have told about all these uh, issues and in fact, and now let's talk about, um, I have about eight minutes, I hope. So let's talk about the impact of the war. So the first war, as I said, had a very serious impact on the Ukrainian economy because in 2014, 2015, Russia occupied uh, 44 square kilometers of Ukrainian territory. It's more than the territory of Belgium. It, it, it's more than the territory even of Denmark, without Greenland, of course. And it was already in 2014, 2015, but unfortunately, um, that was at that time, there was no proper appropriate re uh, reaction towards this aggression. And the, now the aggressor is going on um, in, in its evil actions. Uh, now we have about 18% of territory occupied as for May. Um, and uh, what was the most bitter for Ukraine are these territories of Donetsk and Lugansk um, regions from which Russia has, uh, has launched a proxy war against Ukraine and supplied here weapons and supplied here military stuff, supplied here, um, for example, the system which hit Boeing. MH17, uh, its military instructors, and so on. And uh, this is these territories were one of the most industrialized in Ukraine. And there was uh, a range of metallurgical machine building uh, enterprises. And what was maybe the most painful hit for Ukraine was that. 75 about 75 percent of national coal production was uh, uh, situated uh, on these territories and after the occupation of 95 coal mines only for 47 of coal mines of all over ukraine all over ukraine remained under the ukrainian control and in 2014 2015 we faced first blackouts because it was really an energy crisis, and we should we uh, purchased coal from Pennsylvania, we purchased coal from Australia. There were even some illegal illegal schemes of trade with these proxy republics, unfortunately, and with Russia. Uh, and uh, more than thirty plants, uh, enterprises high and medium technological were destroyed and taken to Russia Federation and used simply as a scrap. So these regions, uh, which were occupied in 2014, they, all, all they suffered a very drastic deindustrialization and general decline and decay. And if we estimate the losses only for the, for, from this first invasion, it's about $700 billion, almost a trillion dollars. Uh, and so, so thousands of billions of dollars of unproduced products, 72 billions of potential investment, which, uh, which were lost because investors do not trust. Uh, so they have pessimistic expectations about the country, about the warring countries, about investing into the warring country. And uh, the military expenditure uh, has, has increased uh, to four percent from one and a half and now one quarter of our gdp unfortunately is military expenditure uh, uh, but this the hit from this uh, full-scale invasion is even uh, harder uh, in terms of destructions in terms of uh, losses of human lives and uh, as long as we are talking about economy and uh, its economic influence as well. And only now experts from the World Bank say that the damage uh, 
during the year of the invasion amounted to 135 billions of dollars and the need for reconstruction is 411 billion dollars um so probably the war is going on and each day there are reports about new damages about new destructions about new victims and i think that till the end of the war it will be more than trillion dollars ukraine will need to repair everything and to return to the normality and um, European funds and US funds and international financial institutions, they do not have such capacity. So as for now, we do not know how to cover this sum. Probably, you know, Russian um, assets are arrested. Probably they uh, will be used as well to refund this damage. Um, and according to the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, the uh, drop in GDP per capita is in real prices is about nine percent so in general the dynamics of real wages is pretty the same so we can uh, say that uh, ukraine uh, ukraine people lost about 10 percent of their welfare but it's once more again due to the international help it's not such as a huge tragedy as it could it, as it might be. Here you see the impact, uh, the, the main industry which, suffer, uh, the, which suffered um, the damage was industry, of course, uh, because services have, services have already recovered, um, agriculture to some extent. Uh, and here you see, I, it's in Ukrainian, unfortunately, I didn't translate it, it's the dynamics of real GDP of Ukraine from March 2000 22 to April 2023, probably March and April. It's a projection. And we see that Ukraine GDP in um, January and February, it started recovering compa compared to what it had, had been in January and February uh, in, in, not in, 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 in March and in April of the 2022, the first two months of the war. However, we, we see here, uh, this is uh, April 2022, we see a fall 40%, yes, in May we see a fall almost 40%, yes, and now we have a recovery only less than 30% and a bit more than 20%. So the recovery, of course, is much, much weaker than the uh, drop uh, which was uh, which Ukraine economy experienced in the beginning of the war. However, it's um, it can be a sign of very um, cautious optimism about the further uh, development. And uh, of course, uh, very maybe um, Mr. Tamara will talk about this as well about the Russian missile strike strikes on the Ukrainian electric power grid because it had really, they were carried out in October, November, December, and January. And they really uh, uh, um, uh, hurt industry very much. So it influenced, first of all, the everyday, uh, everyday life of people because in November we have uh, a day when all uh, the due to these missile strikes, all the Ukrainian nukes were cut off, and Ukraine was uh, without electricity. And then in Odessa, we experienced numerous attacks on our electrical substa sta uh, substations uh, using Iranian kamikaze drones called Shahed. And in Odessa, was one of the most difficult situations. We uh, had no electricity for three, four, year, four days round, and then it was given for two year, for two hours, and then shut uh, shut down for ten hours, and then was given for two hours once more again, and you need to do all of this. And it was very hard even for us, relatively young and relatively healthy people, and what can we talk about disabled people, about elderly people, about people with uh, serious diseases. It's it's really a tragedy. They wanted, they were intended to provoke a humanitarian catastrophe, 
but fortunately they failed. It was very hard, but we survived. It was now uh, a, um, a large scale humanitarian catastrophe and nature or God also helped us because the winter was very, very warm. In, uh, in Ukraine and in Odessa, we, we didn't have a, even a single frost a day this winter. And it also, it, which is not typical. Uh, and it also helped us to survive, but it also, it also of course, um, impacted industry and uh, impacted Ukrainian GDP. Also, each, each uh, it was a great help uh, with transformators uh, from European countries with uh, electric generators and each now, each, each cafe, each um, grocery store, each shop, each um, a barber shop and so on, they all have electrical generators because they, uh, and it was when in the hardest day, it was like a huge noise from everywhere, uh, from the generators. Um, so that's it. Um, uh, uh, they were um, uh, undertaken some measures to uh, tackle this situation. First of all, a fixed exchange rate was established um, for, for for commercial banks as well. But now uh, it's not so far from the market exchange rate. So now 37 hryvnias for one dollar. Before the invasion, it was 29 hryvnias. So not 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 very huge fall once more again due to international help first but uh, our national bank is conducting very kind of very conservative policy and there are a lot of critics of this policy because they consider that the interest rate of national bank or central bank in terms of europe is too high it's 25 percent however maybe it's a, a bit uh, this situation is a bit softened by the ongoing program of affordable loans Five seven nine percent for small and medium sized enterprises, uh, and uh, of course international aid, thirty eight billion dollars, huge aid, um, and from thirty two billion dollars in two thousand twenty two, fourteen billions have been grants. Uh, the last slide about the prospects of our future prospects. First of all, uh, first we hope that the mass reconstruction and innovation will lead to the change, to the structural changes of economy. Because the economy of Ukraine suffered very much. First of all, we have our ports blocked. Uh, oh, about uh, challenge. We have our ports blocked and uh, seaports blocked. And we have uh, as well uh, uh, embargo from Poland and other countries for the uh, export of our production. There, initially, it was even ban of its transit. However, now if this ban is lifted and uh, we at least can transport <clears throat> our uh, agricultural products. And this, to a large extent, it was artificial uh, measures and not very well substantiated. However, I hope that these uh, problems in future will be solved. And as well, uh, European funds will also help us but uh, uh, on behalf of our countries, there also should be realized some steps. First of all, we need to tackle corruption because we really have major improvements uh, in terms of corruption perception index. But anyway, we are very, very far from the European countries and we should, do, uh, we should uh, tackle this. The next is uh, the necessity of the deep institutional reforms. So first of all, the reforms of juridical system because on, unless, uh, investors cannot protect their private property going to a court. They won't invest into uh, our economy. And it's also a crucial thing. Uh, first of all, uh, and then our so policymakers should have a clear vision of structural reforms. I'm not sure, in fact, to be honest, that they have. Uh, however, I hope that uh, they will it work out. Uh, uh, and these institutional reforms, uh, anti-corruption reforms are very important and I hope, of course, our president is a hero for us, but I'm, I'm not sure he gets it well 
So the importance of this reform, because I think he believes that uh, if he uh, everything there can be proper, honest people, everything will work. However, we should build institutions, yes, uh, independent on uh, concrete people. Uh, it's maybe someone will explain him this. I, I, I hope so. Uh, uh, and of course, we now have almost no fiscal incentives for investment and innovation. The last one were lifted in 2005, like it was um, tax cut for reinvestment into the high tax project. It was the preferences for um, technological parks for special economic zones. They were all, uh, they had been all canceled. And now uh, our policymakers returned to the problem of technological parks. However, I hope that to the other problem of um, working out of fiscal and um, monetary incentives for investment innovation, they also returned to this problem. And our central bank is also criticized because it, it keeps inflation relatively moderate. However, some critics say that this policy is too strict and it hinders the uh, development of the production of the real sector of the economy. Uh, in future, I hope that after our victory, at least they will reconsider this policy. And, uh, and I hope that also goodwill from our European partners, not only in terms of funds, but in terms to allow us to take our own competent decisions uh, in order to develop our economy, to upgrade it. So for us to be not a simply a resource annex of Europe, but a prospering countries and not only us, not only we are interested in this, but as well Europe, because it will be a good example of shifting towards democracy, yes, and I think that less countries um, will be eager to remain, yes, under the sphere of influence of authoritarian regimes like um, Putin regime. And I hope that our intellectual potential, human capital will be used because we have really a, a, a range of very advanced industries. We have rather developed pharmaceutical industry, by the way. We have some remains of airplane buildings, of rocket buildings, this of uh, engine for, for helicopters. Uh, it's uh, the biggest, one of the biggest European plants of this build, uh, the um, motor siege is in the Parisia. So that is why it can be all con commercialized and turned into the economic success. And, the well, and as well, the potential, great potential of our IT sector, because now it's embodied only in services. But I hope that appropriate policy will turn uh, its, re its results into the successes in new industrialization. So it will be not only in the sphere of services, but it will be, it will enhance productivity in the real sector, in the innovative um, um, industries. So thank you very much for your attention. Mucha, muchas gracias. So Slava Ukraini, Viva, Viva España, Viva Valencia. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to you, Alexander. Thank you so much for your inspiring and, and I think that very uh, instructive and uh, very interesting uh, talk. And I'm sure that uh, after the second talk of this season, uh, we can have the opportunity to exchange with you and ask you things that uh, we have in mind for you to Thank you so much for you. And uh, well, right now, as uh, we mentioned at the beginning, we will continue with the second talk uh, uh, with Tamara Kam Kawiska, that is with us this uh, evening. And the talk of uh, this uh, PhD professor of the Taras Estesco National University of Kiev uh, is titled Life Under the Burden, Coping with the Challenges. Thank you uh, again, Tamara, to, to stay with us. Thank you uh, for sharing your knowledge with us this evening. Hello, everybody, and thank you uh, very much for inviting me and for this just brilliant opportunity to be a presenter here. Um, well, I'm really very grateful to all Spanish people for their genuine interest uh, um, in Ukraine and, of course, just the support uh, of our country in uh, this hard time. Well, 
Um, my talk today will be a bit different and I will look at uh, the war time period from a bit different perspective. And I would like to focus on uh, basic survival challenges, which I divided into three of them. So physical survival challenges, mental survival challenges and national identity survival challenges. So the war has been a reality um, in my country for more than a year already. And hundreds of people are killed, wounded, tortured, raped, and kidnapped on a daily basis. We are losing our friends, our parents, our colleagues, our best students. And what is the most painful thing is that we are losing the best representatives of the younger generation of Ukrainians, those who are in the front and who are fighting against the Russian occupiers. It's really a nonsense in the first in the 21st century that my a six year old granddaughter, instead of learning how to read and write, has to learn how to distinguish the sounds of a missile, of a drone, and different types of artillery. It is a double nonsense that just every day when I get up in the morning and I do realize that the fact that I am alive today is either a mere coincidence or a brilliant work of the Ukrainian army. And everything is happening in the 21st century in the heart of Europe. The brain actually refuses to accept the reality, and the reality is really terrible. So um, dozens of cities have been either completely or partially destroyed. Thousands of facilities such as kindergartens, schools, uh, medical facilities, um, uh, universities uh, have been completely or partially destroyed. The, more, the most painful thing is that uh, museums are destroyed purposefully and the most rare and valuable exhibits are stolen and the history is purposefully destroyed. Thousands of kilometers of highways, airports and ports are also destroyed, just the same as millions of square meters of housing. Moreover, 25% of energy system has been destroyed, just the same as this um, uh, uh, town of Bakhmut, just the pictures of which uh, you can see. Well, before the war, uh, that was uh, a town of a million roses. Uh, there were only 70,000 uh, residents of that town, and now it has been uh, turned into ashes. Well, and the paradoxical thing is that this city was liked by Russian tourists before the war. Lots of them came to this town on regular weekends. And that's why our brain can't accept the fact, just the fact. We can hardly understand uh, this war. Uh, but on the other hand, we are trying to accept some pleasant moments. And uh, you can see um, uh, the photos of Butcher Town uh, in March 2022 and in March 2023. Well, uh, this is the street that actually stopped the uh, Russian tanks and prevented from coming uh, to Kiev. Well, and in a year, just you see that the town has been rebuilt. Uh, just the houses are either renovated or built in you. And this is really a ray of hope uh, well, for us in this war. Just the most terrible challenge is that children experience just their uh, biggest hardships and difficulties. Uh, seven, all seven million children are affected by the war according to the UNICEF organization. Moreover, more than 13,000 children have been kidnapped, 
uh, or deported by the Russian occupiers, and they were taken to Russia, well, uh, to be adopted by the Russian families. And the tragedy is that there is no access to those families. The UN uh, just can hardly control this, the process of adoption, and no informa there is no information just about the well-being uh, and health of these uh, uh, children, as well as their fate in general. Uh, moreover, just uh, more than one and a half million children are at the risk of mental illness. And 30% of those kids who are living on the front line, well, have already developed just a lot of, uh, lots of symptoms of psychological diseases. Uh, so, well, um, that's why well, it's difficult to accept this reality, just the same as it's impossible to accept uh, just the, the reality of this uh, um, situation with this girl, well, who is a survival, uh, of, uh, survivor, survivor of Bucha. So uh, Sophia is 12 years old. Well, and just the parents were killed uh, when they were trying to leave the town and escape by car. So um, now just uh, she has got only an elder sister. Well, and um, we are very grateful to Spain because Sophia just um, was undergoing a psychological rehabilita rehabilitation while in one of the camps uh, in Spain. So <clears throat> that's why uh, really it, it is very painful well, to accept all those hardships and, and challenges, but still uh, we have learned how to uh, accept uh, well them. The only challenge that we can never accept and we will never accept is the uh, national identity challenge. While we do understand that our nation is at stake and this war is the existential war. So we do understand that our nation might disappear from the map of the world forever. So that's why just um, we're asking a lot of questions. How, uh, how did it happen that just that the Russian world monster, yeah, uh, developed into that absolutely violent, aggressive creature just who attacked us? Um, so because of this, well, um, the situation in the society has changed a lot. Well, first of all, um, if we compare just the self-identification question, well, uh, on the eve of the war, only 64% of Ukrainians, or actually of Ukrainian citizens, uh, identify themselves as Ukrainians. In August 2022, just the figure was already 85%. Lots of people stopped using uh, Russian in everyday communication because of this situation. Yes, of course, we, we were under the rule of, of the Russian Empire and then uh, just the Soviet Union. And we, we had a lot of common... Uh, uh, cultural events, we were um, uh, influenced linguistically, socially, uh, moreover, we had uh, lots of uh, mixed marriages, and uh, um, no doubt, yeah, the language situation is also uh, not so easy. So that's why uh, sometimes they say that the language situation in Ukraine is more complicated than, than Ukrainian grammar, although just the Ukrainian grammar is not that easy uh, as well. So uh, that's why, well, here you see that the slogan now just 
uh, well, in Ukraine is goodbye, chicken Kiev, hello, chicken Kiev. So um, in 2017, there was that this campaign, and now just the um, it's a kind of uh, accepted variant of uh, spelling uh, Kiev instead of Kiev. So because Kiev it was the Russian transliteration, and uh, Kiev is the Ukrainian one. So uh, um, hence. The ideological myths of the Russian world are the biggest existential challenges for us nowadays. Um, but uh, well, if we ask the questions, how did it happen? And um, how did we allow that to happen? How did they make the whole uh, world believe that their culture is exceptional? that their literature is the best, that their uh, literature is, is extremely unique. Well, the question crops up. Well, is English literature less unique and less exceptional? Is Spanish literature less unique and less exceptional? So who made us believe that? How was that idea formed? Well, so, and we have lots of questions and we have no, not uh, answers to all those questions. But uh, I guess that at least we should try to debunk th uh, just some of the myths. And myth number one proclaimed by Vladimir Putin is that uh, there is no such a nation as Ukrainians and it has never existed in history because we are one nation and there, there is no difference between uh, these two peoples. So to, uh, uh, well, to try to receive at least partial uh, answer to the question, let us address the Russians themselves. So here, well, uh, you see the quotations of Russian uh, politicians, uh, scholars and historians just who uh, expressed their opinion about uh, Ukraine and Ukrainians. So um, Viktor Chernomirin used to be our ambassador, um, uh, I mean, Russian ambassador to our country at the beginning of the 20th century. And even he noticed the difference uh, between Russian and Ukraine Ukraine when crossing the border, but that was the, their 21st century. Um, in the 19th century, while well, a Russian scholar, pa Pavel Sumaroko, so actually um, stressed on a striking difference in everything, uh, in, in houses, well, in appearance, and uh, he wrote, I see different faces, different clothing, different habits, and I hear a different language. Have I, have I come to a different country? So just imagine that uh, Ukraine was under the Russian uh, rule at that time. And the impression for him was that he came to a different country. Uh, the historian Nikolai Kostomarov um, stressed on another feature that um, Russians are inclined to worship power, despotism, and autocracy. They easily tolerate oppression and lack of freedom. Ukrainians are freedom loving and inclined to democracy, as it was in the Parisian siege. So, a Zaporizhian siege just existed in the 17th century, and there were Cossacks who uh, ruled this uh, uh, siege. Well, we have uh, turned to Russians themselves, but now let us look at the opinions of foreigners who visited Ukraine uh, in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries as well. So um, if we look at the opinion of the Danish geographer, again, you notice here just the difference uh, well, in 
uh, lifestyle and also just the uh, clothing and um, pay attention that um, the um, uh, Russians were wearing birch bark shoes uh, and these are traditional shoes of Finnish people so actually uh, Russian borrowed uh, just these shoes uh, from uh, Finland well <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, the notice is that Ukrainians uh, uh, don't wear uh, birch bark shoes. And moreover, uh, Russia is not called uh, Russia at the time. Yeah, it is called Moscovia uh, because it consisted of Moscovia lands. So that's the uh, uh, historical truth. Uh, but Ukrainians are called by him the descendants of Kievan uh, Rus, or Rus, it, it depends how you pronounce it. So uh, then um, if we uh, look at the opinion of uh, Wilhelm Hobbes' book, and I was really surprised myself to read that, well, uh, just he said that I consider Ukrainians to be the best warriors. A Ukrainian warrior is loyal uh, until death, so actually. And uh, well, also a surprising uh, opinion was expressed by the representative of French embassy and uh, just um, uh, uh, the quote here is that amidst clashes with Moscovia, one must consider the strength of Ukraine. Once independent, Ukrainians still have not forgotten what independence was. Despite the despotives of Moscovia, uh, uh, which strifles everything Ukrainian, this Cossack nation is still freedom-loving. It would be a fatal blow to Moscovia if Ukraine became independent again. Then it would have played a major role in the liberation of all the peoples who are now under the yoke of Moscow. So, uh, doesn't it ring the bell? So, history seems to be repeating. Well, uh, we can also just look at this problem from the point of view of arti uh, just artistic perspective. Uh, you see here two pictures of the uh, Russian painter, although it's just he also has got some Ukrainian origin, uh, Ilya Repin. And uh, the top picture is the reply of the Parisian Cossacks to the Turkish Sultan. The picture is based on real Ivan. And uh, just uh, another picture is barge haulers on the Volga, also based on the real events. If you look at these two uh, paintings, you see a striking difference while in the behavior um, uh, and self-esteem of these people. Uh, it is observable that just the Cossacks are equal, just they have the right to voice their opinion, while uh, just the, they are absolutely free they have friendly communication well and uh, just they don't look oppressed while uh, just these people well look really unhappy just they they are exhausted they are uh, oppressed yes and they're exploited and moreover just an interesting historical fact that uh, barge haulers were used in Russia and actually in the Soviet Union until 1929. So people were used as slaves to pull barges uh, on the water. Although in Europe at this time, steamships were used. Well, another uh, myth of the Russian uh, propaganda is that there was no Ukrainian language. And so actually that uh, Ukrainian is a village dialect of the great Russian language. 
So uh, the linguistic truth is that all Slavic languages, including Ukrainian and Russian, were dialects uh, initially, and then just uh, because they were formed out of the proto-Slavic language that existed until the ninth century. And just the uh, territory of uh, these languages actually is marked in pink here. After the 10th century, all these dialects uh, started developing separately and they developed into separate languages. Just a historical proof is that uh, just on one of the walls of St. Sophia Cathedral, uh, which is uh, now in Kiev, well, which was built in the 11th century. So the graffiti is uh, in Ukrainian. And uh, let us mark that in the 11th century, no Moscow existed. So yes, of course, we have got some commonalities because we have Cyrillic alphabet. Well, we have um, some common words and it's clear, but the difference in sounding, vocabulary and grammar is also uh, huge. Moreover, just there is also a comprehension asymmetry, well, which is the proof that these are different languages. Ukrainians understand Russian much better than Russians can understand Ukrainian. Well, and it's clear because Ukrainians, uh, due to their colonization period, well, have developed their natural uh, bilingual skills, unlike the uh, Russians who uh, are who have always been monolinguals. Well, from the point of view of vocabulary difference, so you see here just their uh, group of Slavic people. And uh, so uh, this is Ukrainian, this is Polish, uh, this is Russian, and this is Belarusian. And uh, well, just this is the computational analysis of the vocabulary of all language groups, and we have the following results. Ukrainian uh, well, is the closest to Belarusian, and we have only 16% of different vocabulary. Well, after Belarusian, Ukrainian is uh, closer to Polish. Well, we have got 70% uh, of common vocabulary. And Slovak uh, language, again, we have got 68% uh, of common vocabulary. And uh, uh, if we speak about the um, common vocabulary between Ukrainian and Russian, so we have got 62% uh, only, uh, and uh, actually this is uh, the, this is the fourth uh, yes language after Belarusian, uh, Polish, and Slovak. So actually, uh, this difference can can be compared to the difference between Spanish and Italian and uh, uh, French and Portuguese, just with 33 and 39% of uh, different vocabulary correspondingly. Well, just the, uh, one of the mo most painful um, pages of our common uh, history is that, uh, we had lots of um, banning orders while uh, regarding the uh, bans on teaching and uh, uh, speaking and printing books in Ukrainian. And even uh, while in uh, modern Germany, you can uh, see just the uh, kind of monument, which is an indicator that uh, in 1876, uh, the Russian Tsar Alexander II well, signed the uh, AMS decree banning teaching and printing in Ukrainian in this house in Germany. Well, I have given here just uh, well several decrees banning uh, using Ukrainian. Well, but of course the, there are much more of them. Well, but the question crops up. Well. If there is nothing, uh, just if, if there if uh, Ukrainian has never existed, 
And if there is no such phenomenon as the Ukrainian language, well, what is the sense in banning something which doesn't exist? So again, just there is no logic. And again, just the brain refuses to uh, understand uh, just uh, the reality and the actions. Well, uh, of course, language is a part of the mentality and, and mentality is reflected in language. But also uh, we have some other criteria um, that are indicators of ethnic mentality of different people. So, and one of the marker, one of the markers is uh, just lifestyle and family life, uh, well, of, um, of the citizens. So, uh, here you can see two photos of Russian, it is the left photo, and Ukrainian families. And the photo was made in the same period. This is the end of 1880s. If you look at the left photo, well, you can but notice that again, just the um, people are tired. Uh, just the ladies are far from being happy. Um, just the impression is really very uh, depressive and sad. Um, the uh, Ukrainian family, was the first of all. Uh, well, is depicted with the musical instruments, and um, well, uh, it is really so that Ukrainians love singing, and uh, um, um, just in all um, choirs of all uh, Russian czars, uh, actually eighty percent of the singers uh, were uh, Ukrainians. This is a historical fact. Well, moreover, just. The majority of composers were brought from uh, uh, Ukraine well, to uh, the Russian concert uh, halls, I mean, just under the uh, uh, czarist rule. Well, and let us look at the family uh, just itself. So, um, well, this girl is uh, smiling. Well, these girls are not smiling, but still just uh, we can hardly say that they are unhappy or that they, they are exploited or just they are oppressed or something like that. So we don't see, just at least we don't feel that uh, um, just from the photo. Of course, just the clothing are different and uh, um, Ukrainians had to be able to embroider uh, just their blouses. It was a kind of uh, it was a must with every girl. Well, that's why um, just they uh, did it, uh, especially in winter. Well, uh, that was the tradition. Well, from the point of view of uh, anthropological uh, characteristics, um, we should say that, well, you, you paid attention again, I, I guess, that the um, the appearance of people was also uh, different. I mean, the anthropological uh, appearance was different. And according to historians, uh, Russians are mainly made up of Finnish, Hungarian, and Turkic tribes. And a Slavic origin falls uh, uh, down on 30% of population only. And mainly, these people are lived in uh, Novgorod area. Uh, on the contrary, uh, just Ukrainians are prevailingly made up of uh, Slavic tri tribes, and just anthropologically, they're closer to Belarusians, Poles, and Baltic nations. Well, from the point of view of lifestyle, again, well, uh, Russians uh, were nomadic people. So they were traveling warriors. They were conquerors of other territories traditionally. So that's why they were fast moving tribes. They didn't have stable values. And because of military character of communication in those military regiments, just uh, authoritarianism as well as autocracy uh, just uh, were developed. 
Uh, Ukraine um, used to be land workers. Well, that's why just they had property, they had they had the pieces of land, they had the uh, houses. That's why just they were slow moving tribes. Just uh, they settled and they uh, continued living there just for many years. That's why just they have they had common and consistent values. Uh, well, they built churches there, and that's why, uh, of course, there was the uh, constant place for living after that. Plus, uh, just they uh, had inclinations towards the de uh, towards democracy instead of autocracy. <clears throat> so uh, then, again, um, just another marker that. Uh, is an indicator of ethnic mentality, is just an attitude to women. Uh, historically, the Russian society uh, was uh, male domineering. The male superiority just was a natural thing. And uh, uh, moreover, uh, males had rather practical attitude to women and uh, just the home violence uh, was tolerated and was considered to be uh, absolutely normal. Moreover, just there is even a proverb uh, in uh, Russian that a battered wife is a loved wife. So uh, in Ukrainian, it's not uh, acceptable at all. And historically, the, the genders in Ukraine were equal uh, just the, um, there was a respectful and aesthetic attitude even uh, to women because in many folk songs, uh, women were praised for beauty and intelligence. Well, just the proof of this um, fact can be found in the uh, in lit in literary process because uh, you can hardly give just a couple of names of famous female writers or, or just uh, in Russia. Well, although just there are, they were uh, those writers, although uh, they they were underestimated and uh, they their role was minor. Well, in the, in the literary process, I myself actually finished school uh, just under the Soviet Union period, and uh, Russian literature was subject number one as well as the, the the Russian language. And I don't remember a single name of a female writer. Uh, just uh, the school curricula was always built only around male uh, Russian writers. So, uh, and the opposite state of things is in the Ukrainian literature, because uh, the female writers of the 18th, 19th centuries played a major role in a literary process. Uh, such writers and poets as Lesya Ukrainka, Olha Kobylanska, Marko Vovchuk, so were translated well into European languages already in the 19th century. And just they uh, they were very famous uh, well abroad, just as and they were extremely uh, acclaimed uh, just in Ukraine. Well, this inequality uh, well, can be traced even uh, just in the uh, language reflection. So we have got the one of the same word, Drujina. Well, uh, although just uh, the meaning in both languages differs a lot. In Ukrainian, Drujina means wife, and the root of this word is friend. So it means that wife uh, well, is a friend of a man. Moreover, just the preposition while well, in the uh, uh, verb, just after the verb um, uh, to marry is, uh, well, if we translate literally, literally from Ukrainian is with. Well, it means that there is no domineering. So this is, well, um, this is friendship, uh, well, or uh, man with a uh, uh, woman. Well, in uh, Russian, Druzhina means a unit of warriors. This is a military regiment. Uh, 
and it shows that uh, a Russian male considers a, a just a comrade warrior, a friend, instead of a wife. So, and uh, again, if we analyze just the Russian word uh, uh, to marry, Zhenitsa Nakunta, so the preposition here is own. It, it shows again, just the domineering role of uh, uh, a man over uh, just the female. Well, so the man is always above. Uh, then, um, Another very unpleasant and really terrible um, phenomenon which uh, existed uh, in the Russian uh, society until the beginning of the 20th century is uh, in Russian, uh, which means sexual relationship between a father-in-law and a daughter-in-law. Uh, it means that um, several generations of Russian people used to live in one and the same house, and the house uh, just frequently had only one room. Well, and uh, the uh, son, for example, was sent to uh, to earn money in another. Um, uh, land or in another city or in an another village or just uh, he was sent to the army and the uh, young uh, wife of the son used to live with um, uh, father and mother-in-law and then just um, this terrible uh, just relationship started so that's why uh, when we were really trying to have the clue to those numerous uh, cases of rape, even of children in Bucha and other uh, um, cities, we could, we could hardly understand the roots of that, uh, well, behavior. Well, maybe uh, it, is, it is inherited, well, um, in this tradition, it is rooted here, well, um, well, everything might be. Well, um, no such phenomenon uh, was uh, found in Ukraine, well, because young couples live separately after marriage. And this is the tradition inherited from Austrian, Hungarian, and Polish rule. And I do remember that my great granny uh, told me stories that, uh, well, in, in, the, in her village, uh, and she lived under the Polish uh, landlord, just the, um, a landlord uh, gave uh, uh, just the land then uh, to build the house. And uh, then the whole village was invited uh, to help uh, and build the house for this uh, newly married uh, couple. And they started living separately. Well, it, just this inequality and different, uh, uh, well, um, uh, attitude is also uh, uh, reflected in folk traditions. Both uh, Ukrainians and uh, Russians have um, Vesnyanka spring folk ritual. So it is a kind of dancing and uh, singing festi festival uh, while at the beginning of spring. Uh, and as a rule, just uh, one girl uh, had the honor to start that for a singing and dancing festival. Well, in Russia, as a rule, a girl whose father was the richest uh, was invited to start uh, that festival. Well, um, so it means that even at that time, well, what was respected most is family social status. Well, uh, not the personal achievements of uh, the girl. Well, in Ukrainian uh, tradition, uh, the best land worker or the most beautiful girl uh, started the uh, festival. And what is very important here that if we speak about the beauty, so it does mean that uh, the girl um, had to demonstrate very fine uh, features of her uh, face or something like that. So uh, the accent was made on um, 
the ability to produce uh, the best embroidery of the blouse. Uh, plus, um, the girls were encouraged to uh, maintain their beauty naturally uh, by means of um, caring after uh, the health of their uh, skin, uh, caring after the health of their hair, so that's why just girls went to the woods, they uh, picked up herbs, uh, just they uh, mixed uh, milk, uh, sour cream, butter, and uh, just those herbs in order to have a kind of, uh, well, um, skin caring uh, creams or something like that. So plus, I do remember that my great grandmother uh, just used to watch uh, just the hair, uh, hair uh, with the help of uh, rainwater. And just uh, uh, um, she always uh, told me that, yes, that's why just uh, my hair is so uh, thick and uh, uh, brilliant. Well, if you um, use, if you look at these uh, Ukrainian uh, girls uh, and lady, uh, just of their of the 19th century, so the photo was made again at the end of the uh, 1880s. So you see that um, the skin is really uh, well cared after. Well, and um, well, um, on the other hand, uh, just the push of this lady is an indicator that. Uh, she is far from being oppressed, and that uh, she does have uh, just, um, if not equal, uh, position in the family with the husband, or uh, just, or even a domineering position. Yeah. So um, that's why just the difference in lifestyle, uh, just and in the uh, attitude to women is can be traced in uh, historical documents photos etc well i would like also to demonstrate some other cultural arguments well and um, um, it's an interesting fact uh, that kiev mohila academy uh, well which is uh, uh, still uh, in, in kiev was founded in 1615 while Lomonosan State University was founded in 1755. So um, most Ukrainian scholars and uh, uh, teachers, and writers who uh, were graduates of Game of Hell Academy then were taken by the Tsar by, uh, to uh, Russia and actually we have exported not only natural resources, but uh, intellectual resources to Russia. That was a tradition uh, under the Tsarist rule, and that was the tradition under the Soviet Union uh, as well. And another very surprising fact, and it's really a paradoxical situation which was initiated by the Soviet uh, government, is the fact that uh, Pushkin is considered to be a founder of uh, modern literary uh, Russian, and he was born only in uh, 1799. Well, while uh, Kotlerevsky, who is considered to be an, uh, a founder of modern literary Ukrainian, published his book already in 1798. Well, and just the Russian government actually uh, falsified the situation and they uh, recommended that Taras Shevchenko, so uh, this is the photo of Taras Shevchenko, it is uh, just a very famous poet and painter uh, and thinker of the Ukrainian nation. Yes, we do respect him, but uh, we can hardly say that he was the founder of the uh, modern literary Ukrainian. Well, but uh, just um, be, uh, the Russian government, well, could hardly agree that Kotlerevsky uh, just uh, uh, um, published the book 
much earlier and that a literary Ukrainian language uh, was uh, officially uh, founded much earlier than uh, just the Russian language. That's why uh, in Ukrainian textbooks of that period, well, uh, just when I used to be uh, a schoolgirl, uh, uh, the information was that the founder of the Ukrainian uh, modern literary language uh, was Taras Shevchenko. And uh, well, it's an interesting photo, uh, well, because we see here just uh, a group of uh, young uh, men uh, just with the photo of uh, a Ukrainian poet. And I was trying to uh, look just the same photo uh, just with the Russian people uh, with, for example, uh, a photo of Pushkin or any other poet. And actually, uh, just I failed to find it. So uh, that's really, well, a funny uh, fact. Um, folklore also is the reflection of uh, ethnic mentality. And, um, well, if we look at fairy tales, just this is a good illustration. We have international plots in fairy tales, and of course, that dragon killing plot is common for uh, for a lot of um, folklore uh, genres. Um, uh, the only thing that um, in if we analyze uh, Russian fairy tales, dragon is usually fought uh, by a physical power, and uh, the reward uh, was is a result of a lucky chance. Uh, in Ukrainian fairy tales, dragon is fought by intelligence, hard work, and uh, creativity. And uh, in the Ukrainian uh, fairy tales, it's an interesting fact that there were no uh, soldiers as protagonists. But in uh, Russian fairy tales, uh, just uh, the soldier was a, a frequent protagonist in uh, lots of fairy tales. Uh, then the the protagonists of Russian fairy tales are um, not so active, and they prefer well to uh, to 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 wait for uh, just some lucky moment well to get the reward. Well, of course, just it's it's um, it can be accepted well, but. Uh, a definite behavior mode is modeled here that everything should be provided by the Tsar or by the state. Well, so just some a passive model of behavior uh, might be formed. Just in Ukrainian fairy tales, the reward can be uh, obtained only uh, for good actions and uh, hard work and efforts. And um, just, I would like to um, compare two uh, very similar uh, fairy tales, uh, Nikita Kozumyaka uh, in Russian and Kirill Kozumyaka in Ukrainian. So uh, again, just the plot is just the same that uh, uh, just the protagonist well, is going to uh, look for the dragon, then just he finds the dragon and uh, doesn't kill the dragon, but instead, well, both protagonists tame uh, the dragon. The, uh, and uh, then just the dynamic is a bit different. In the Russian uh, fairy tale, uh, Nikita um, signed an agreement uh, just with uh, the dragon. They decided to divide and rule the world, to divide the world and rule the world together. Well, the dragon agreed and they started uh, ruling the world um, together. But well, in a year, Nikita deceived uh, and killed the dragon. Well, in the Ukrainian fairy tale, the human was a bit different. So again, the dragon was tamed, and then uh, uh, Kirill turned uh, the dragon in, into a drag gox, a kind of domestic animal like an ox to plow the land. So then the dragon got thirsty, 
uh, started drinking uh, well, uh, uh, water from the Dnipro River, but he drank too much and actually, uh, well, uh, well he, he, he blew up. So that's the uh, difference. Well, these are illustrations from uh, a Russian and Ukrainian uh, fairy tale. Uh, just here we see uh, the fairy tale about Yemela, who is a laser bone, and uh, just he is um, expecting a miracle. And uh, just the cat in the Ukrainian uh, tale is uh, so working well to, to cook some meal. Um, folk songs are also markers just of the ethnic mentality of people. And for Ukrainians, folk songs have always been a compensational, a compensational mechanism because just the uh, people were prohibited to print books in Ukrainian, to speak Ukrainian, but uh, the only uh, well, the only possibility uh, to implement uh, uh, just ideas uh, well, in Ukrainian uh, just uh, was um, singing something. Well, um, so actually, Ukraine is the only nation that um, has created more than 20,000 uh, songs. And uh, um, according to UNESCO, uh, the second nation which, which follows us is Italy with 6,000 folk songs. Uh, in the UNESCO collection, they have, uh, a, they have a list of recorded 15,500 uh, folk songs with melodies, and that was registered in 1950s. And um, just the uh, thing is that the latest entry was uh, uh, in 2022, and the song was by Raktar. When the invasion, st invasion started, and I do uh, remember that uh, funny uh, melody and funny song well, about by Raktar, just that was a kind of promotion of that a Turkin, a Turkish um, weapon. Um, according to, again, that historian Kostomarov, uh, who, uh, who researched both Russian and uh, Ukrainian folklore, uh, Russian songs are about beautified reality and false state of things. And again, so uh, it does ring the bell and because of that Russian propaganda, maybe. Uh, Ukrainian songs are about real state of things. Well, and um, it's an interesting uh, quote um, by Leo Tolstoy, is the Russian, uh, a famous Russian uh, author, who wrote that no other nation has shown itself in songs as brightly and beautifully as the Ukrainian people. Uh, yes, so the nation is really singing, and the uh, Ukrainians love music, and they love dancing. Um, oh, well, and uh, and humor. So we have uh, analyzed several aspects of um, different uh, of, of different. Um, of difference in mentality, yeah, and we have looked at anthropological uh, differences and the differences in lifestyle, uh, differences in uh, attitude to women, to social life, uh, and uh, um, we, we have also made a, an attempt to debunk just the myth about uh, non-existing Ukrainian language, non-existing Ukrainian nation. Well, but uh, what is the final word? Well, to conclude, I would like to say that no nation is better. Just they are different with different culture, language, mentality. And unfortunately, these mentalities are at fight now. The political myths 
are far from the reality. And uh, these ideo ideological dogmas, unfortunately, again, have served as justification uh, of the invasion. Thank you so much. So I hope that you have liked just my talk. Thank you to you, Tamara. Thank you uh, for your talk and for uh, all the information and the interesting and uh, also uh, inspiring for us uh, thoughts and also information that we need to share with our community and with our uh, uh, in turn. I think that this is very important. Thank you so much. Well, we don't have too much time, but I, I know that there are some questions on the chat and uh, we have some and others. Uh, then I will appreciate if you uh, can uh, answer uh, the question shortly. Uh, as we have uh, the, the contacts, uh, if uh, there are uh, some questions that can be answer right now in this context, then we can uh, share with you by email with the whole uh, office. Uh, Mar? We have, we have one, quest one question for Alexander. Uh, what percentage of Gram Ukraine used to send to African countries through the Odessa port before it was blocked by Russia? Thank you very much. I, I see here even two questions. Yes, from Professor Elza. Yes, was the first one. So uh, it was written a bit earlier. So I, I, I'll start with the first and then move to the second one. So about the first question, if I got it right, you ask, um, you want me to sum up, yes, the main message of my presentation. So yes. Generally, there are two messages. The first is two messages. Yes. The first one is that Ukraine now is facing the deepest economic crisis. is face facing now the deepest economic crisis uh, in its modern history. However, uh, we should acknowledge and admit that Ukrainian economy could have performed much, much worse. And this is for, and uh, it could have caused as well a huge humanitarian catastrophe. However, outside of battlefield, unfortunately, there is no such catastrophe. Yes, of course, we are experiencing hardships, sorrows. Of course, we are facing the drop of our living level, but it can tolerate it. Yes, and so that is why there are two reasons for this. The first, is uh, very generous and, in fact, enormous support for, for our Western country, uh, for our Western uh, partners. And the second reason is that we really uh, managed not not to fall apart, but to stand. And uh, it really proves that we are capable, at least, of acting in a crisis situation because uh, there was no day in Ukraine where, when financial institution or go government institution did not work. Yes, so all every and each of them was resilient, was operating. Uh, people could withdraw money from ATM even 21st, 25th February, 26th February, and so on. Uh, and, uh, could uh, get some help from government institutions. So that means that first, uh, due, due to first of all our partners and due to ourselves, this situation is not as awful as it might be. It's the first message. And the second message is that, um, as I said, we really advanced in building of democracy and in forging our civil society. However, um, our economic model was not so brilliant. And this is due to two reasons. It's not only because of our external enemy, so to, to, to a large extent, of course, about uh, because of it, yes, because of the war, which 
uh, was launched in 2014, but it's also due to our internal inefficiency, our false policies, our corruption, our oligarchization, and uh, but I believe that we have all the potential uh, to um, re rebuild our economy and we should think not only about the rebuilding and the reconstruction, but also about the reformation, reshaping, restructurization, renovation, and we can gain it only uh, through the very active and sound actions from ourselves and from our, first of all, European countries. First of all, from ourselves, we should beat corruption, we should form effective institutions, um, and we should introduce really um, not non-trivial policies, yes, not so, uh, simply orthodox policies about liberalization, privatization, uh, deregulation, yes, uh, it, it also should be about some structural reforms. And our European partners should, um, of course, they should uh, trust us, and we should be transparent, totally transparent, but uh, of um, on their side, on your side, uh, it uh, would be nice if you also allow us to do maybe some heterodox, non-trivial actions, yes, in our economic policy, because our um, past experience, there were some um, controversial things, for example, when European Commission advised, advised us to leave the ban of export of our uh, raw, raw wood. Yes, uh, this export led to the devastation of our nature. However, the European Commission said, no, 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 you should do it. But on, on your side, you established very, very small quotas, for example, for our production. So no, no, it's not, not, uh, I am not accusing anyone. However, so we, from our side, we should be, we should be transparent. We should be transparent. We should. Uh, re uh, really uh, conduct real reforms, yes, and on the uh, on the side of the European Union, yes, it, it, it would be better if you give us some extent of liberty as yes, in our decision making, and that is why I think we can, using our intellectual potential, our resources, our technologies, we should really uh, have a very good result uh, and Ukraine uh, might become a, 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 show, a showcase, yes, of, of successful reforms and shifting uh, towards the democratic um, governance and society. Um, thank you, thank, thank you very much for your uh, um, questions. Thank you very much uh, for, 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 for your support and from your institutions, both and, for, and from your country. Also, this support is huge. And about the about the question of uh, of um, yeah, I, yeah, Alexander, we have another question. Is is for Tamara? Second. Yes, it was for me about the uh, inclination towards democracy. So yeah. those were quotes. Yes, of uh, those. Uh, 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 foreign tourists who visited uh, Ukraine in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, and uh, just those were uh, just the opinions. But uh, so actually, um, the inclination towards democracy is rooted in this the Parisian uh, the Parisian siege, when Cossacks actually had a collective body, and there was a council, and the every decision was. Uh, adopted collectively, just plus uh, um, a, a hetman who was a kind of chief there, uh, but just um, could be always criticized. That was the, uh, the main thing. Of course, I guess that maybe, well, it is uh, just a negative uh, well, a feature of uh, Ukrainian uh, character because a lot of foreigners usually ask us, why are you so critical? And it is really so that we are critical of our government, we are critical of ourselves, we are critical of colleagues, and we express this criticism. And sometimes really, I, just, we, I, I do remember that uh, I just when a British professor came on a visit to our university, just he asked this question, why are you so critical? Well, I guess that uh, that was just we we did inherit uh, uh, that from uh, Cossacks, and one more very important thing that 
uh, the Parisian siege actually uh, just adopted uh, uh, the constitution, the, it kind of the image, a prototype of the first constitution, which prohibited uh, death penalty. It, it's not death penalty, but it's a kind of uh, um, execution, yeah, as punishment. Well, uh, because Hetman was uh, against this. So that's why, and um, uh, liberty and freedom just were proclaimed the basic values just uh, well, um, by uh, that document. So that's why uh, Ukrainians uh, were always uh, ar arranging protests against uh, oppressions and uh, while um, uh, in Holodomor, uh, just actually was uh, also arranged already in the Soviet Union, while well, to suppress Ukrainians who were against the government and against the uh, policy of the Soviet Union. So that was uh, just uh, the uh, the case. Mm -hmm. And my down. Well, uh, is also the result. <laughs> well, because well, unlike the Russian society, Ukrainian society protested. Yes, and if we didn't want uh, President Yanukovych to be our president, we came to Maidan, and uh, just we uh, had the result. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, and but we are asking. A lot of questions. Why are Russians so passive nowadays? Although just there are a lot of Russians who are against the war, who don't support uh, just that uh, uh, regime uh, of Putin, but still just they uh, they can't um, arrange my down, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. that's the thing. Mm -hmm. The, the space of the freedom, no? the, the the space for, uh, to to can contest, no, in some way, mm -hmm. they can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, finally, I want to appreciate again, uh, uh, we have started at four. I know that uh, it's uh, a short time for, for all of us that we are preparing this series uh, with very um, uh, passion. And I think that was uh, heard also. And uh, thank you to you for sharing with us your knowledge again, for for appreciate this initiative that we have had through how uh, researchers that come from Ukraine. I think that is one of the ways to maintain uh, the, the spirit of the university as universal, very life. Uh, and uh, I think that this is like the the point to start another uh, uh, exchange uh, between us. Um, then uh, finally, I want to invite you all of you uh, that you are in the in the session to meet again in this space in the thirty first May uh, next week. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we will enjoy the third and, and the last talk of this series uh, lectures that we have organized uh, under the name and the title of the closer look at Ukraine war and testimonies of life. Thank you so much again for everyone. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias por todo. You're welcome. Yes, bye. <laughs>